Welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here this morning. Thank you for coming out to be with us today. We have a bunch of people gone. We have about 100 uh, or so folks at camp this morning with uh, your children. And yay them, right? <laughs> awesome. They've, they are having a great week. And I think they come home tomorrow. Is that yes. right? And you're supposed to be there at what time? 10.30. 10.30. If you... If, if, you don't, if you're not at camp at 1030 or here at noon, we're going to FedEx your kids to you, all right? So we'll give you a tracking number when you leave today. So thanks for coming out to be with us. Glad you're here. And if you're a guest, thanks for helping us by filling up for some of our folks who are gone today. Uh, there's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate when it passes by just a little bit. And if you have a prayer request, put that on that card and we will pray for you. The last time I checked this morning, and I haven't checked since about 8 o'clock, but I think they've gotten four of those kids out of that cave in Thailand. Has anybody got an update on that? Six. All right. That's awesome. Here's the thing that amazes me about that. The whole world is watching it, right? And you've got people who are willing to give their lives for somebody they don't know. That's phenomenal. That's, to me a sign that God is active in the world and doing some great things through some heroic people. The really remarkable thing is that over 2,000 years ago, a man knew us 
And I think he did. I think he knew you. He knew who you would become. And he died for you anyway. That's what's awesome and amazing. And that's what we're here to celebrate today. And that's why we can be real with each other and with him. Because he knows us and he cares about us. Hey, let me get you to stand and listen to this passage together with me from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Because he knows us and died for us, we don't have to pretend we're something we're not. Paul talks about this, and he, he talks about how he had this struggle. And here's what God said to him about that. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes, because of that, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. And so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake, I actually delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. Because when I am weak, I am strong. You can be real because he loves you just as you are. And he's there for you. Let's praise him for that and all morning long. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name.
1 John. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us. Be seated as we take our offering. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. For His high is the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. How could I forget His love?
few weeks ago, most of our adult classes were looking at the book of Judges. And over and over again in the book of Judges, it mentions that the people did what was right in their own sight. It was evil in the sight of the Lord. And over and over again, God always listened. And when they finally repented and turned around, God came through for them. And the reason I'm mentioning that is today we're talking about just as I am. No matter what you've done, no matter where you are in your life, you are not separated from God. God is waiting, God is willing, and God is able to catch you, to help you, to bring you back from wherever you are. And this is an important message for many people. Many people think they've blown it with God. They think however bad they've been, God's love just isn't good enough to cover them, and that's just not true. You know, the, the Bible talks about the people in Israel did what was evil in the sight of God, and yet God was ready and willing. So wherever you are, whatever you might have done, whatever you might not have done, you know, maybe you're self-righteous, God's love is self-giving greater than your self-righteousness. Whatever you've done, God's love can cover you, and he can catch you just where you are. Pray with me. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your son. We praise your name for your love. We praise your name that your love is greater than all of our sins, that your love can cover us and just bring us out of wherever we are. We thank you that you're willing to meet us, that you don't set a standard that we must accomplish except humility that we just need to bow before you, fall on our knees in your presence, and you're there. Lord, we thank you so much for that grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
cross over um, what I just said earlier about how uh, wherever you are, God will accept you. Because there are people in this room that for years, for decades, maybe even for a lifetime, have felt that they've blown it with God. Um, so it doesn't, you don't get past that quickly if you've been living that way for a long time or thinking that way for a long time. But God does want more. He will accept you where you are, but he wants more for you. And I love the passage in uh, 1 Peter. I'm reading from the message here. The reason he wants more and, and what he wants from us is to be instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made from you, or for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. So not only will he accept you where you are, but then he will allow you to be part of his great cause to then turn around to others that feel the same way you may have felt and to bring them out of that darkness as well. Pray with me. Lord, we do thank you so much for your redeeming grace, for the crucifixion of Jesus and the fact that we know we have victory because of what you and he have done. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for second chances and 795 chances, Lord. And we thank you so much that you are always willing, you're always able. Lord, may we dwell on what you've done for us at this time. May we be mindful of your great love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just as I
So a long time ago, a politician named Pilate asked a prisoner named Jesus, what is truth? We have no way of knowing whether it was an honest question seeking an answer or a, the snarky side mouth comment of a cynic or the resigned acceptance of a status quo that Pilate knew he had no hope of changing. But the answer a lot of people would give to Pilate's question is, the truth is whatever you want it to be. In fact, the word truth itself can refer to a lot of different things. It can refer to objective reality, the idea that, that some things are true regardless of your feelings or your opinions or your perspective. They're true for you and they're true for everybody else. They're just true. Lots of folks think that objective truth is kind of like Bigfoot or UFOs, a figment of somebody's imagination. You have your truth, I have my truth. I actually had a professor in seminary years ago who declared in a, in a class that there is no such thing as objective truth. And I, I raised my hand and said, are you sure? And he said, yes. And I think I was the only one that was going, do we see this? <laughs> the idea of authenticity is another way that we talk about truth. We talk about being real. Uh, being true to ourselves, not being false or fake. Authenticity is highly valued in our culture these days. It, it may be, authenticity may be one of like the top two or three virtues to which people in our culture aspire. We, we don't want to be inauthentic people. We want to be and we want to be with genuine people. We're going to talk a little bit more about that this morning. And then there's the most fundamental way of talking about truth. The, that's where the words we speak reflect how things really are. This is what your mom was looking for when she asked you who threw a rock through the basement window, you or your brother. And then she added, now tell me the truth. Truth in this sense means that if I say something, you can count on it. It means that if I ask you a question, you, you're going to give me an answer that is accurate and one that I can trust. Truth means that we don't lie to each other. That when we make a statement, that statement is in harmony with the actual state of things insofar as we know them. Now, I wouldn't blame you if you thought, well, all three of those ways of thinking about truth may as well be on the endangered species list. An objective truth. The idea that, that a thing is true for all people is the baby that was thrown out with the bathwater of patriarchy. And we're living in an age where truth is determined on the micro level of me. Um, the thought is that each individual has the inalienable right to, to determine his or her own truth, no one may impose their truth on another. Never mind the fact that by saying no one may impose their truth on another, you just imposed your truth on another. Um, the next time somebody tells you that 
you have your truth and I have mine. That's what, what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. Ask them, is that true for everybody? I call that fun with logic. Okay. Truth in the sense of authenticity is just as rare. In 2016, Americans spent $16 billion on cosmetic surgery. We want to look younger or thinner or richer than we actually are. And the, the breeding ground for inauthenticity is digital, and it's on all of our social media platforms. Because that's where we go to project an image to the world that we wish were true, but probably isn't. We, we, we like the things other people like, not because we like them, but because we want to be liked. Uh, a lot of people treat life like a play like it's Shakespeare's As You Like It. We walk onto the stage of our lives, all the world's a stage, the men and women merely, merely players. We walk onto the stage of our lives wearing our costumes and our masks, carefully selected to uh, present ourselves as a character of some kind, and we, we never really take them off to show people who we really are. And of course, telling the truth, Words being an accurate reflection of reality, that's fallen on hard times as well. The percentage of Americans who trust the media is at an all-time low. We certainly don't trust our politicians, candidates, and office holders in both parties. I don't care which one you are. And the independents are the same way. Will say things they know are not true. In, in order to win votes or whip up their base or woo donors. And the truth is, if we had the technology, and we probably do, to go back and review every moment from this past week of your life and mine, how many of us would have told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in every circumstance? So help us God. Those are some pretty negative assessments right there of our culture. And, and just last week, what did I say? I said we got to be more positive. we got to look for the beauty. we got to look for what's lovely in the world. And here I am trotting out all this bad stuff. And, and last week I said let's don't focus on only the negative, And this week I've kind of focused on the negative. But those examples that uh, we just went through of relativism and inauthenticity and deceit are not all there is to see out there. Uh, there there've always been people who would lie when the truth would do better. You probably have known people like that. But then there have always been other people who tell the truth even when it is very, very expensive to tell the truth. In 1925, Anybody, has anybody played on a Robert Trent Jones golf course? 1925, Bobby Jones was in an 18-hole playoff with a, a competitor named Willie McFarlane. That was for the U.S. Open. On the 11th hole, uh, Bobby Jones hit his drive into the right rough. He was still, it was still in the fairway, but it was in some thick grass over on the right side of, of, of hole number 11. And as he stood over to address the ball, which is when a golfer stands uh, before the ball and places the club on the ground and is about to hit it, when he put his club down to get ready to hit the ball, the ball moved. Now, this was 1925. There were no TV cameras out there to, to give us instant replay. Nobody in the gallery saw the ball move. The officials didn't see the ball move. McFarlane didn't see the ball move. The only person that saw the, the ball move was Bobby Jones. And he could have said, you got away with one, and gone ahead and hit his shot. But he called an official over and he said, I moved my ball. And they said, well, you, we didn't see it. And he said, well, I saw it. And he took a one-stroke penalty. Finished the hole, finished the round, and lost by one stroke. When, when everybody came up to him and started commending him for his honesty, Bobby Jones said, isn't that sort of like commending somebody for not robbing a bank? In, uh, the, 19, uh, in the 2013 baseball season, 
Giants reliever Jeremy Affelt was looking over his contract extension from the Giants, and he noticed an error, a half-million-dollar error. And he, he immediately notified the Giants' front office, and they very quickly made a correction. The reason they were so quick to correct the error in his contract is because it was in Affelt's favor. They had accidentally, accidentally given him a contract worth a half a million dollars more than they'd agreed to. Talk about blowing up a salary cap, right? So why was, why was that felt so quick to give up something that he could legally have made claim to? Here's what he said. He said, I, it, I won't sleep at night knowing that I took that money. Every time I open my paycheck, I'll know it's not right. Let me tell you one more because this is my favorite story about honesty. It's from, it's from about 14 years ago, 15 years ago, 2003. In Springfield, Illinois, there was a high school quarterback named Nick Hasis, H-A-A-S-I-S. Hasis was a few yards short of the state career passing record. On the last play of the last game of his senior season, he covered those few remaining yards with a beautiful pass to a wide-open receiver. Now, the odd thing about it was, and Hasis noticed, noticed this when the, when the play uh, took off, he, 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 when the ball was snapped, he noticed that the defense backed off the line of scrimmage and that the corners made no attempt to cover the receiver. He found out later that I think at halftime, his coach went over to the other coach and said, hey, my guy's really close to this record. Could you guys just maybe back off and let him... Make the co his coach made a deal with the other coach. And the other coach told his players not to defend the pass. So three days later, this 18-year-old senior wrote a letter to the state athletics board and asked them to omit the final pass from his career statistics. Here's what he wrote. I would like to preserve the integrity and sportsmanship of a great conference for future athletes. They excluded his last pass, those few yards, and he did not get the record. Now those are three stories, to me, inspiring stories. Examples of people who in critical moments decided that integrity was more important than success, that authenticity was worth more than pretense, and that truth was better than a lie. Sure, there are lots of people out there who hold a squishy definition of truth, who pretend to be something they are not, and who say whatever is convenient in the moment. But there are many more people, and I'm going to bet a bunch of them are in this room, who are tired of running simulations. We want to live actually, not virtually. People who recognize that truth is not just an individual preference, but, but a real thing that exists outside themselves. Whether people believe it or not, there are people who believe there is a right and a wrong. They want integrity, not invention. They are tired of pretending, and they may not know it, and we may not know it, but we are doing exactly what Paul told us to do in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, when he said, whatever is true, think about such things. Now we could do, I could do three different series of some length on one on objective truth and one on authenticity and one on truth telling without making sure our words match reality. But because it's kind of a holy grail in our culture these days, I wanted us to focus on authenticity this morning. To quote my old friend Inigo Montoya, we keep using that word. I do not think it means what we think it means. There are two ways we get this wrong, this idea of authenticity. In his book, Uncomfortable, which is a, a book I recommend to you, uh, an author named Brett McCracken notes that for many people, living authentically means living in conformity to how you feel. If you, if you do not follow your feelings, then you're being fake. You're being 
inauthentic. Because the problem with that is that emotion is a notoriously unreliable guide to, to a good life. There, there are lots of things that we feel like doing that we do not do precisely because doing them will be bad for us or for others. And there are many things that we do not feel like doing that we do because we know they are good or necessary things. We've been here before. You kind of know how I am about grocery lines. If I, if I get in the 10 items or less line at the grocery and somebody has 37 items, I feel like punching them in the back of the head and then looking down at them and asking, do you even math? Am I being inauthentic if I decide to not punch them and wait patiently? And, 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 and even though I know they're chipping away at the moral fabric of America, <laughs> is that inauthentic? No. I'm, I'm, do, I'm almost doing what Jesus would do. I'm almost doing... What Jesus would do is not punch them and pay for their groceries, and I'm not going to pay for their groceries, right? That's not inauthentic or fake. That's what the Bible calls self-denial. Here's the thing. If, if, you don't, if, you, if you walk out after this, that's fine, but listen to this and take this with you. Jesus never calls us to be true to ourselves. That is not in the Bible. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. That's in the Bible. We are never told, be true to you. You do you. The Bible never says that. The Bible says just the opposite. Don't do you. Deny yourself. Being authentic is not living in harmony with your feelings. It's living in harmony with your beliefs. Now, there's a whole other series on are my beliefs worth living in harmony with, right? Because your beliefs could be wrong. But, but it's really important to understand that, that authenticity means you live according to your beliefs, not your feelings. I feel like doing one thing, but my belief tells me that the thing I feel like doing is wrong. To be authentic, I must reject my feelings and live according to my belief. That's one way we get it wrong. The second way we miss what it means to be authentic is that we confuse and a church like Twick, for a church like Twickenham, okay, this one, this one's for us. We confuse authenticity with brokenness. If somebody speaks often and openly about their brokenness, we think of them as genuine and authentic and transparent and real. And if they embrace their imperfection, we kind of grant them a certain moral authority. Brett McCracken again writes, it's almost as if our sins have become a currency of solidarity, something we pat each other on the back about as fellow, authentic, broken people. And then he says, but sin should be grieved, not celebrated. Is a person any less authentic if they never cheated on their spouse? Are, is a person less authentic, less real, if they never pilfered money from the petty cash drawer in the office? Authenticity and brokenness are not the same thing. Last, this past week, Adrian buzzed into my office, and she said, there's a call you need to take. And so I, I answered the phone, and there was this young man who told me in the first 30 seconds that he was homeless frightened, alone, and an addict. Now listen to him for just a minute, and, and then I, the first question I asked him was, are you high right now? And he said, I'll be honest, I used this morning. Now, th that's pretty authentic. That's pretty real. I mean, he was being honest. 
we, we're working with him, Scott Martin and some other folks are, are on our outreach committee are working with him. We've got him off the street. We've got him in a hotel. Several folks have lined up to help him, and he's going to enter into his way on Tuesday morning. His way is a Christ-centered recovery program for men. This young man was up front with his brokenness. He told the truth about the reality of his situation. In that sense, he was being real. He was being authentic. He was, he was being truthful. But that's not enough. Admitting we are broken, while important and necessary and commendable, is only the beginning. It's not enough to be real. Because if we just leave that young man where he is, if he stays in his addiction, he's going to die there. Being real is not enough. Listen to something Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter three, uh, 4, chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, all those feelings that you have, <laughs> they're not always good. You were taught to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul calls, calls it your former way of life, your old self. Cultural authenticity would commend you for admitting your corruption, and celebrating you for your transparency. Authentic authenticity, biblical authenticity, means, yeah, you admit that you're broken, but then it calls you to repent of the sins that broke you in the first place. And then you live into the life Jesus calls you to. We, we love the just-as-I-am part in the old song, Just As I Am. We're not as fond of the to rid my soul of one dark blot part. I, I, wanna be, I, want you, I want you to receive me just as I am. And Jesus goes, I, okay, receive. Now let me work on that dark blot. He's eager to welcome and pardon. But as the song goes, he also wants to cleanse and relieve. We come broken, he wants to mend us. We come wounded, he wants to heal. The real, authentic, true life is one that's created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, the more authentic you become, the less like you you actually look. The more authentic you become, the more like Jesus you look. So being authentic doesn't mean I'm being true to me. It means I'm being true to him. Every lie we tell, every pretense we manufacture, every time we stretch the truth or inauthentically live out of step with what we know is right, all of that is motivated by the desire to look better than we are to gain acceptance we think we can't get or to avoid shame we, can't, we think we cannot escape. Deep in its heart, dishonesty, inauthenticity, faking it is a theological problem. We have forgotten that God loves us just as we are, that we don't have to pretend anymore, that the first thing God requires and, and makes possible is for us to be real with him. Now, he's going to receive you just as you are, but he's not going to leave you just as you are. I want to be sure we, we get that. But, but the first thing God says is just be real with me. We used to tell our boys when they were little, there is nothing you can do that will ever make me stop loving you. And there is nothing you can do that will make me love you more than I do right now. We're sinners, Lisa and I, and we said that to our kids. God is holy and righteous and perfect. So if I would say that to my kids, imagine what God would say to you. Nothing you can do will make him stop loving you. You don't have to fake it with him. 
You tired of living a simulated life? You tired of living a virtual life? One maybe you borrowed from somebody else? Listen, God loves you. He receives you just as you are. He's not going to leave you like he found you because he's already imagined. God has already imagined what your life could look like if you lived truthfully, authentically, and it looks just like Jesus. Can, can I just encourage you to do something here this afternoon, tomorrow? Carve out a little space in your day to think about what is true, to imagine how you're going to respond the next time you face a choice between honesty and deceit, reality and fantasy, authenticity and pretense. Imagine yourself being honest in that moment. Imagine yourself authentic, living consistently with what you believe to be right instead of what you feel feels comfortable. Imagine yourself being real, being made new, as Paul said, in the attitude of your mind. Let's stand, let, let me pray over that for us, and then we'll finish up here this morning. God, it is a scary thought that you know us you know stuff about us that nobody else knows. There are things that only we know and you know. Things that we would just, we shudder at the thought of other people knowing our secrets. We have no other choice but to be real with you because you really know us. And so it is staggering to know that you love us just as we are. Help us to really believe that because all of our pretending and all of our deceit and all of our inauthenticity comes out of wanting to avoid that shame or look better than we are. Help us really believe you love us as we are. And God, the scary thing is that you're not willing to leave us the way you receive us. You want to make us be real you want to make us be like Jesus. Help us be as eager for your power to change us as we are eager for your power to save. God, we come broken, mend us. We come wounded, heal. We come empty, fill. In Jesus' name, amen. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with just as he is. Have a great week. Let us pray together. Dear God, we just thank you for this day, for the time to come and worship you, and to think and meditate upon the words that Jody shared with us. Help us always to be authentic, always to reflect Christ. And may people see Christ living in us this week as we try to live our lives authentically. Be with us, watch over us, and guide and direct us to our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.